Hello, everyone. My name is Amelia Javitovskaya. I am the CEO and founder of the Flourishing Center. And thank you guys for chiming in and for tuning in to this webinar presentation as part of the MAP Alumni Association's um, offering to the community to talk about how do we thrive in uncertain times. And we have about half an hour together scheduled for this webinar, at which point afterwards I'll bring you guys over from the attendee view where you're just sort of receiving me talking at you um, to being able to be panelists and we can have a conversation and do a little bit of Q&A together. Um, I'm excited to share this work with you. This is um, a program that I have created since um, I first, well, actually, I, I'll tell you about my, my interest in, in positive psychology and what brought me to the concept of resilience, but I've been running the Bounce Back Better program for the past five years, and we train positive psychology practitioners at the Flourishing Center. I run a certification program called the Certificate in Applied Positive Psychology, or CAP program, and we also um, some of the programs that our facilitators can, our trainers can go on to do is our Bounce Back Better program. So I'm excited to share this with you to tell you more about the approach that we take to resilience and how we think about resilience as a comprehensive and a systematic approach. So in a, a little bit, I'm going to tell you about this concept of the cube or the B-cubed system. But um, let me first tell you guys a little bit about myself and again, what brought me to this work. So I refer to myself as a pracademicpreneur. Um, some, you might've heard of people calling themselves a pracademic. I tapped in a little preneur there on the end of it. Um, I came to MAP, to the Positive Psychology uh, Master's Degree at the University of Pennsylvania as part of their second graduating class. So this was in 2006, 2007, which is just, crazy that it was such a long time ago um, and I came to a I came to this work with a big interest in, in two topics in particular one was resilience and the other one was um, an interest in savoring as an intervention for helping people heal from eating disorders uh, which I had found myself having had been healed tremendously by the power of gratitude and savoring. And as a practitioner, I came to this work, I was really young, I was 21 years old when I did the MAP program. And I knew I wanted to be a coach and a motivational speaker. And at the time, I basically thought to myself, well, who's going to take a 21 year old life coach seriously, I must need some science to support me, um, even though I had already been doing this kind of work and teaching and coaching uh, people kind of unofficially. So as a practitioner, I came to this work because I was really interested in how do we help people utilize interventions and put the science into practice. Uh, the academic side is in addition to my master's degree in positive psychology, I'm in the uh, more than halfway through a PhD in mind-body medicine from Saybrook University and have continued from my positive psychology training at UPenn to continue to study um, primarily the intersection between the mind and the body and other interventions and at the Flourishing Center, which is the company I'm an entrepreneur of, we do a lot of work with continuing to stay true to the science. So we run a research program where every week we put out 10 new studies that have come out in the field of positive psychology, thanks to our uh, dedicated researcher and our team, AJ Levin, who does that for us. But we also conduct research on our students. So the certification in positive psychology program, the CAP program, is uh, a program where we actually test our, the impact of the certification and this training on our students pre and post. And so we, I, um, a huge fan of using the science, both in staying up to date with the literature, but also to actually use the power of measurement in how we inform, uh, to inform how we teach and what we do. And the last bit is the entrepreneur piece. So I'm not just a passionate entrepreneur about my own work at the Flourishing Center, but I'm actually like tremendously passionate about helping practitioners and change agents get their work out in the world. So some of my favorite work is to think about how we take the, particularly the students who go through our certifications and how we help them create careers for themselves and sustainable work for themselves in the world and turn their passion for helping into sustainable work and, and a career. Um, so I'm not just passionate about my own business, but I'm just passionate about business and how we take this work out into the world. 
Um, and as I mentioned, some of my background, so I do hold a master's degree in applied positive psych from UPenn, as do the other speakers of the series. I'm also a master certified coach with the International Coaching Federation. Um, I've also built out our own coaching certification program here at the Flourishing Center. Um, and I'm uh, an in progress with uh, my PhD in mind body medicine at Saybrook University, along with other certification programs. And so as I mentioned, we run a number of different training programs and this program, the Bounce Back Better program, is one of the programs that I've built out to help our practitioners take positive psychology and take it in a very specific way out into the world. And the positive psychology training that we that I've built out with this Bounce Back Better system is focusing on teaching essential resilience skills for helping people become more effective and adaptive in a rich and engaging way. So the Bounce Back Better program um, consist of four different types of skills and we teach those four different types of skills through four levels of training and in order to explain that I actually want to tell you a little bit about what brought me to an interest in resilience and then I'm going to go through the different skills and what um, what we can learn from each of those individual 16 skills because it's a four by four cube um, but I'll tell you more about what, um, what brought me to an interest in resilience. And so as I um, uh, mentioned, I wanted, I came to the University of Pennsylvania wanting to understand what are, what is resilience? And is it something that just some people have and other people don't? Um, or is it something that we can actually build? And my interest in that came from my own uh, need to be resilient and as this image conveys. So this was published in 1999, in August of 1999, when I was 14 and my brother who was swimming at night with his fiance and a few friends um, were out in the, uh, the beach here in New York in, Lo in Long Beach and my, my brother and his fiance and a few friends were out kind of partying and his fiance started drowning and she was in the water and my brother ran in to try to rescue her and she survived but he passed away alongside one of the other women that was there and he was 24 and I was 14 and this was my first major life life obstacle that um, I'd ever faced and for the months and years that transpired after that I continued to sort of live my life and kind of my parents and I we, we continued with our life um, and I had kind of started my first career as an entertainer and my family and I were my family was never the same ever again after the loss of my brother in this tragedy and at the same time I figured out how to kind of continue to, to live my life and to continue to thrive as an adolescent and some of the messages I had received as a child is I would hear people say things to me like wow Amelia you're so amazing you're so incredible. All the things that your family have, has been through, all the things that you've, you've gone through. Um, my mom became sick about two years after my brother passed away. She got diagnosed with ovarian cancer and she fought and lived with ovarian cancer for about 10 years. Um, so there was a lot of late night in and outs of hospitals and doctors and surgeries and chemos and all sorts of stuff that I, I faced with and dealt with with her. Um, and my dad became a diabetic about 30 days after my brother passed away. And again, there was quite a bit of just sort of dealing with things on, on his, on that side of it with his health. Um, and so, but this, so this message used to haunt me when people used to say like, wow, Amelia, you're so amazing. Everything you and your family have been through and yet you're so resilient, yet you, you keep persevering. And I remember that those words used to haunt me because I remember on the one hand, being very grateful that people were sharing this concept with me or, you know, t kind of praising me. And on the other hand, I would kind of cringe inside and I would say to people like, you know, like, don't, don't praise me for something like this, because trust me, if you were in my position, you would just do what do you, you would do it too. You would just sort of go on, you, you figure it out. Um, I didn't really think that there was anything quite special about me other than you just kind of keep putting one foot in front of the other. Like I couldn't imagine a different way. Um, but those words followed me. And I, um, as I grew up in high school, I had other friends who parents would get divorced or someone that they would have a, a death in the family. And I did see that sometimes that some students would, some, some of my peers would 
face that life adversity and they seem to do worse. They, their grades started to be affected by it. They, um, they turn to, to drugs or to alcohol and to other things. And so it was a curiosity that stood out in my mind. What, what is this thing called resilience? Was it just something that some people had and other people didn't? Or is this something that we could actually bring to people? So when I went to uh, UPenn to do my master's, that was one of the things that I had put in my application that I wanted to understand. And then I was really fortunate. I got to be part of the first group of trainers that came out of the University of Pennsylvania's MAP program. Um, in teaching resilience to uh, what was then the UKRP program, the UK Resilience Program, and then later the Australian Geelong Grammar School Program, where they were bringing resilience to the schools. And so I got to be one of those trainers. And after a couple of years of working for them and my big interest in the body, I decided to leave working for UPenn and their training program and start more of the work I was looking to do with the Flourishing Center, um, in particular because I knew that there were pieces that I felt that were missing in the way that just positive psychology alone was approaching resilience and that there was more that I, I felt was key ingredients to what enabled me to be resilient for all those years um, and what the science was confirming particularly about the integration with the body and so um, after many years of teaching positive psychology to our graduates of our certification program and to date we've trained over 1400 practitioners in over 38 countries which is um, absolutely just kind of still blows my mind that that we're on our 85th CAP class. Um, and so we, we serve amazing people who want to spread positive psychology in the world. And I wanted to create a program for them that they can go out and teach resilience. But this was really tricky because resilience was so close to my heart. And I really understood that in order for people to truly be resilient and to be able to handle anything that came their way, that it's complicated, that there's an, a, that the skills to be able to do that were sophisticated. And so um, I have this thing with a Rubik's Cube, those of you who know me. Um, I normally would actually have a Rubik's Cube as I'm doing this presentation, but I'm quarantined in upstate New York uh, currently. And so I don't I don't have a Rubik's Cube to be able to, to share this with you. But I've known how to solve a Rubik's Cube since I was about seven years old. My brother, who had passed away, um, had taught me when I was a kid. I was born in Kiev, Ukraine, and I was born in the 80s. So it was around the time when like Rubik's Cubes were all the rage, particularly in, in Soviet, in the Soviet Union. And, um, and so I, I have, I used to actually like want to be like my big brother who could solve the Rubik's Cube. And so what I used to do is I would break the cube apart and then reassemble it back together. And that was my way of solving it. And then my brother who just got really sick and tired of having his cube be broken, um, decided to just teach me how to actually solve it so that I didn't continue to like mess up his cube. So for me, um, solving a Rubik's cube is something I use for stress reduction. So whenever I'm, um, I'm kind of like stressed out or um, I, let's say I was like missing my brother, um, I would sort of kind of connect with his spirit by sitting there solving a Rubik's cube. And, and I had an aha moment um, at some point in, in the process where I realized that this was what we was, was this is what was missing in how to teach resilience. And so if you've ever tried to solve a Rubik's cube before, the way that unless you know that there's a systematic way to solve it, what most people do is they chase colors. So you'll put the white side together and you're like, okay, awesome, I've got the white. And now you move on to the red. But in the process of going to the red, you mess up the white. Um, and so the 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 key about um, the how to solve a Rubik's cube is you solve it in a systematic way, and you solve first all of one side, and then you keep the one side, and then you do the top side with just the the top row, and then you keep the top side and the top row, and then you move on to the second row, and then you do the bottom, and then you fill in the corners, and then you um, get in the rest. That ta-da! That's how you solve a Rubik's cube. And so I'm so I'm working I'm doing this Rubik's cube, and I have this kind of a mad scientist moment where I realized like that's what's missing is that rather than just teaching concepts, you have to keep reinforcing the same concepts over and over again. And the way that I had approached resilience from 
uh, for all of these years was breaking it out into mental skills, emotional skills, physical skills, and then what I called social slash spiritual skills. And the reason I say that there's slash is because for me, the spiritual and the social are the same thing. It is our relationship to something bigger than ourselves. And so the skills that I, I identified were these 16, what I call the 16 basic building blocks of bouncing back better, um, which is basically B to the sixth um, compared to uh, the um, of the BQ program, B to the third. And so the concept was to create a that a program that teaches resilience by definition needs to be resilient. It needs to be adaptable and it needs to be malleable. Because remember, I was creating this program initially as just a facilitator training for our graduates of our program because I wanted to give them basically plug and play positive psychology. My hope for the Flourishing Center one day is that we can be like the Zumba of the positive psychology industry, which is to be able to take people who are passionate about sharing these skills and give them all of the things that they need to very easily be able to go out in the world and actually share this. And so trying to create a program that they could package, I knew that some of our students were going into companies and they were going to do resilience training programs and others would be at schools and others would be creating their own brand for themselves as, as speakers and, and teachers of this work. And they would need to bring this into different places and sometimes they'd only have an hour and sometimes they'd be leading retreats for multiple days with a group of people. And so what I created was a system where they could take any one of these skills and they can teach them alone. But the skills also build on top of each other, a la the cube methodology. So these are all the mental skills, the blue are all mental, and these skills build on top of each other from the scholar level to what I, level one to what I call the, um, the ninja level to the maven level and then to the Jedi level. And all the skills on the Jedi level are the real-time resilience version of the skills that come ahead of, of it. And I'll tell you what these skills are in just a moment. Likewise, the emotional skills all build on top of each other, reinforcing the knowledge that came above. The physical skills, the mastery of the body, again, build one on top of the other. And then the social or spiritual skills build on top of each other. So all the levels build on top of each other. It goes across horizontally and it goes across the same way vertically. So you, as you teach these skills, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, they build on each other this way. They build on top of each other with the levels, but they also can be standalone skills. And so these are the these essentials. Uh, the key about them is that resilience is a mindset and a skill set that we can all build. And the program is called Bounce Back Better and not just Bounce Back. And the reason for that is that the approach that we take in teaching resilience is we, um, is we focus on the fact that people naturally are resilient, that we know that our bodies are incredibly resilient, um, that when we break a bone, not only does the bone heal, but it will actually grow back stronger. It will actually lay down more calcium and more bone deposits to actually make it protected for the potential of future injury. Uh, we know that if we want to vaccinate a person and we want to make them immune to something, we actually give them a low level of the disease, knowing the body will actually build up the antibodies to be able to fight it in the future. Uh, we know scar tissue is what our body lays down when we've had a whiplash or an intense injury or a cut, that our body not just heals it, but it actually does so in a way that gives us more protection in the future. And so what we say is that people don't need to learn how to bounce back. We actually know how to do this quite naturally. And as we're facing the um, experience of COVID in particular, um, we know that, that resilience is more the norm. And it's not the exception to the norm. And that most people are actually going to be okay. They will eventually adapt to the circumstances, whatever it might be. And it's very likely that most people will come back to where they were before, before this. And even right now, if you ask people, how are you doing? Most people will say they're doing pretty well. One of the programs I'm currently running is something called the Better, uh, Better Than Before 30-Day Corona Countdown. So I invited people 
people to participate in this 30-day challenge with me where we do a one-hour meeting every day at 11 a.m. And we are coming together around the vision that if we all continue to support each other and learn the skills of positive psychology, that 30 days, hopefully, when this is all over, when we're giving it a container, kind of imagining that it will, um, it's not going to just go on inevitably, that this will all come come to a head soon to try to kind of give us a little bit of locus of control over it, um, that we would come out on the other side of this actually healthier or mentally stronger than, than before. And when the program started, I asked people on a scale of zero to 10, how well do you think that you're doing in, in this battle uh, right now? Or, or how, how well are you handling this situation? And 350 people took this and um, is this one simple question. And I just thought it was really interesting. People said on average, we're about a seven on a scale of zero to 10. And I think that that's really telling, Dora, come here. Sorry, my dog is scratching at the door. Um, that I think that's really telling of human nature and what we know about resilience is that most of us do actually go back. We do bounce back. But the question is, is can we do so better? Can we do so in a way that we are showing up in the world the way that we want to? Which is one of my favorite quotes by one of my mentors, Dr. Srikumar Rao. Um, he says, are we showing up in the world the way that we want to? as a result of this. I'll give you some other words that kind of describe resilience that I think speak to what the world needs right now or what we, how we can think about resilience. Um, the late Dr. Chris Peterson, who I had the honor of studying with when I was a, a MAP student at the University of Pennsylvania, he talked about resilience as the capacity to struggle well. Um, and so it's, it's not a question of are we struggling or are we not, but are we struggling well? Are we showing up in the world the way that we want to? Um, and I'll tell you guys that these skills, they work. Um, they, they definitely are the things that I turn to on a day-to-day -day basis to help me deal with the stressors that I face. And um, with this coronavirus in particular, um, I went from, I'll kind of stop the screen share <coughs> for a second and then I'll come back to it. I, here I still have a cough. Um, so part of it is because I actually have coronavirus right now. So um, I went from not knowing anybody that actually had COVID to having my father die of COVID-19 in about four days from when I first got to him. Um, so this was uh, about, so this was Monday would be, Monday will be this past Friday, so it's Saturday right now, this past Friday marks the two week mark from when I got, when I got the call that my father, I called my father and he told me he was having a hard time breathing and he was coughing um, and he had gone outside when he wasn't supposed to. He went to his physical therapy despite the request for everybody to stay in. And um, so that was a Friday and I um, showed up and my father did in fact have it. And it was just a very difficult time of trying to navigate, trying to get him help um, in our time of coronavirus. I put together a little video Video where I, I told our story because um, it was just interesting. I couldn't get a doctor. Um, I couldn't get hospice in until like four days later. Um, as everything was already backed up. You couldn't get hospice to come in if you couldn't get a doctor to actually say that hospice was needed. Um, so it was this, this little loop that I was in. Um, and uh, it was just it was just a difficult time. You couldn't get access to morphine. None of the, uh, none of the pharmacies were, had morphine in stock. They were all out. You couldn't get a thermometer. Um, and yet, with all of this, I. I did my best to support my father in his last wishes. I did get coronavirus myself as I was exposed to him. Um, and a couple of short days later, I, I was able to get a doctor to come in and we were able to get him as comfortable as possible. And I did have to bury him on um, on Wednesday, the April 2nd, I'm sorry, Wednesday, April 1st. And um, and just sort of in the, the craziness of our times, I was the only one at his funeral because we weren't allowed to have anyone else there. Um, and again, it was it was 
incredibly stressful. And yet at the same time, I think that the struggle I went through, I struggled as best as I could because I had the tools for how to take care of my body, how to calm my own nervous system, how to remind myself that it just was the times that we were in and there wasn't more that I could do. I was doing the best that I could. Um, I knew how to turn to my friends for support, even though it was over the phone and I was, you know, again, the only one that was there. I continued to, um, figure out ways to be of service to those around me um, whenever possible. I continued to do my work just because it felt aligned. And so um, so during these times, I, I literally would think back to the skills that I teach um, and, and just know that these skills definitely made the difference between like there was there was no getting around the struggle um there was just it just sucked <laughs> like there's no other way to put it like a person is dying and they're basically suffocating in front of you and you just you can't do anything um but i knew that i could turn to the things that i could do and i knew about the power of touch to create soothing for the body so i you know with my gloves on and my mask on i just sat by his side and i and i pet his face and i pet his arms and i just Try to calm his body and I knew that my presence there was what was needed and I knew to make the decision that if I had sent him to the emergency room that he wasn't going to get the care that he um, that he would have needed anyway because of his pre-existing conditions and I knew that his wish was that he wanted to stay at home and he wanted to die at home he didn't want to be alone by himself in the hospital so I, I heard Chris Peterson's voice in my head all the time as I was going through, um, as I was going through the experience, which is, you know, resilience is about struggling well. I can't control the fact that we have to struggle, but we can control how we think, how we feel, and what we do. Um, and so uh, a little bit more about, so, so I'll just go right in to tell you about these particular skills and then I'll move you guys over and we can, we can have a, a conversation about it. But I just wanna give you a little bit more about what I think is the, the basic building blocks of bouncing back better and how we can start to put the science into practice in real time. So each of these skills uh, goes through different levels and I'm sort of gonna go through them actually by skill type first uh, to talk Talk, talk to you about them. So the first one is what I call the 1.1M, meaning it's the first skill on the first level and it's a mental skill. And here we look at growth mindset. And if you're not familiar with the research on growth mindset, I believe that all resilience starts off with growth mindset. And the reason for that is because when we are caught in a fixed mindset, um, when we are caught in a fixed mindset, we tend to focus on judging things as either good or bad, uh, right or wrong either you have it or you don't and we know that that can get in the way of people being resilient that people who are significantly more resilient to adversity are the ones that are able to get themselves curious when a situation happens and they're able to ask the question how do I learn or how do I grow from the situation and so that concept of growth mindset when we're facing these things right now one of the ways that we can start to put resilience into action is just to catch yourself when when we're just staying in judgment and what would what Dr. Mary Lee Adams refers to as the judger path um, as opposed to the learner path. So people who get caught up in judgment such as either you're smart or you're not or they get really hyper concerned about themselves being judged are more likely to have a fixed mindset. And so what happens when we just judge ourselves or we judge the situation is it makes us problem focused and it makes us stuck. So even when the judgments are accurate, like this situation sucks. Uh, my situation currently is because of taking care of my father and having had gotten COVID myself, I'm quarantined basically to this room. <laughs> um, luckily in a beautiful part of, of the world, I'm here instead of being in Manhattan, I'm in Saratoga Springs, New York. Um, but there are just some parts of the situation that are kind of annoying, like because I'm quarantined to my room and just the bathroom. I climb out of this window when I need to get outside. Um, I can't go out the front door. I can't use my kitchen. My friends have to like bring me food um, and we're, we laugh about it. But if I just get caught up on judging the situation, um, judging how unfair this is, judging how difficult this is, it doesn't give me things I can do about it. So getting out of judging and into a place of getting curious, what are my options? What do I need right now? How, um, what, what, 
what is within my control. Being curious is actually going to be the prerequisite. It's like the very first skill that we start with when we teach resilience because it enables the foundation of everything else. If we just get caught up in judgment, we're not going to be resilient. The next mental skill that comes after that is uh, what I call 2.5M, meaning it's the second level, the ninja skill, it's our fifth skill, and I call this reframing, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G of personal mastery. So some of you might be familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy, which focuses on separating out the A, the activating event of what's happening from the B, the thoughts that we're having about it, to the C, uh, so the B meaning beliefs, uh, the C meaning how we feel and what we do, um, that as a result of our Bs, our thoughts, um, then we add a D and an E meaning we dispute judgments, we dispute our thoughts, we actually take our brain to court, our judgments of ourselves in the situation, and then we evaluate the thoughts that we have. And then I added an F and in a G and the F means after you work with your thoughts, you work with your judgment thoughts, um, what's the fixed mindset at action and what's the growth mindset at action that you can take as a result of it. And we look at this, the, we look at this as personal mastery, personal mastery meaning how do, we, um, how do we work with our mind and how do we work with our body to show up in the world the way that we want to. So in this skill, I focus on teaching people how to catch their thoughts, their, their limiting beliefs about themselves, like I don't have what it takes or um, this, is, uh, um, this, this is too much out of my control or I'm not good enough and judgments that they have of themselves or the situation and help them understand that it's not what happens to us that impacts how we feel, we can actually catch and reframe those thoughts. And so this first level skill, we just sort of learn the concept of fixed and growth mindset. Then on the next level, you start to actually work with specific types of judgments and work with them. On the third level of mental skills, meaning the things that we're shifting in our mind, we learn how to work with worry. So I call this one working with worry and doubting your doubts. Here, I look at helping people understand that how they handle our brain's tendency to go to what next? What's going to happen? What if this happens? What if that happens? If we don't learn how to control our thoughts and control our worries or doubt our doubts, we're not going to be as resilient because worry is an emotion that's very human. It's very natural. And what worry makes us want to do is when we're scared, we want to hide. We want to run away. And so if our worries get the best of us, that protection mechanism of running away was very useful for short-term stressors, meaning if I hear a loud noise, I should want to run away. I should be hypervigilant. But when it comes to things that have to do with the future, which most of us do need to be thinking about, because a lot of the things that we're worrying about, we're not going to be able to get answers to in the next 90 seconds or in the next minute. We're talking about things that we're only going to find out when we get to the other side of this pandemic, which is going to be likely a number of weeks and months before we start to get any kind of answers on what life will look like. So we look at how do we work with the worry and separate out worry from problem solving? Because when we're caught up in the worry, it actually gets in the way of us being able to problem solve into the future effectively and efficiently. So we peel off the working, the worry from the problem solving. And we, I teach people how to work with their worry thoughts, calm them down so that they can be showing up in the world the way that they want to. So they're more likely to be able to work with their thoughts. And then the fourth level accumulates all of this. And we help people look at how they can talk back to their thoughts in real, in real time. Um, uh, Yes, Lisa. Lisa asked if I'll be uh, if I'll send the PowerPoint slides. Yes, I'd be so happy to send these out to you, so you can just take it in. And so the real-time resilience, the fourth level, what I call the Jedi skill, is when you put all the previous skills into practice and we're actually able to talk back to our thoughts in real time. So I call this one mind over chatter, tools for mastering thoughts. And we look at how to work with worry chatter, motivation chatter, mindset chatter, ju um, judgment chatter, and uh, I think guilt chatter. What's the other one? Um, Regret chatter, regret chatter. And so this is about catching the beginning part of what your mind is saying, like, what if this happens? Or I can't believe I did this, or I'm so this, and actually talking back to your thoughts in real time. And so these mental skills all build on top of each other. You can learn each skill individually, but they also culminate at the end of this particular, um, with this module. 
applying the time, I'll just go through the others a little bit quickly. Um, in the emotional skills, we focus on emotional intelligence as the very basics in the beginning. So I focus on helping people understand that positive and negative emotions impact us differently. And it's not that some emotions are good and others are bad. It's that we want to be able to work with the emotions to get more of the positive as we want them and need them, and to be able to minimize or, or downregulate our uh, the negative emotions that we feel. And so we look at emotions not being good or bad, but that we need to learn how to work with them, how to leverage positive emotions to get creativity, to get curiosity, to use, broaden, and build to problem solve, and how to have a negative emotion that we're able to digest and move through us. Um, then the next level of emotional skills, we get more finessed. Now we say, okay, let's build emotional intelligence and understand even more that there's a relationship between specific types of thoughts and specific types of feelings. And this skill builds on this concept of A, B, C, D, E, and we start to help people get even more mastery over their emotions. Mastery of understanding that specific types of emotions are tied to specific types of thoughts. And as you shift your thoughts, you can shift how you feel feel. And um, in this, we also teach about the things that put us into threat mode, threat mode and stress mode, so we can better understand that there are specific conditions that put us into threat mode. And when I understand what those conditions are, I can better regulate my emotional response. On the third level of emotional skills, we look at energy management, and we call this becoming your own CEO, chief energy officer. So we treat emotions as energy in motion, and then oftentimes what happens is, is our emotions get the best of us, or we kind of swallow them and we get stuck in an emotion because we don't know how to move the energy of our emotions. We don't know how to shift how we feel, and we don't realize how to tune into our self-regulatory response because emotions, we can actually build emotional regulation. We can actually train ourselves to dial certain emotions up and dial certain ones down. And it has to do with managing the concept of energy in your body. And so an emotional skill that gets more sophisticated but builds off of the things that we just learned beforehand is teaching people how to shift their feelings um, by understanding when are they depleted? How, what are their triggers? And how to work emotions through their body, how to understand how um, self-regulation works, how emotional regulation works so they can use it better. On the fourth level, I call it emotional alchemy. And these are tools for mastering feelings. And so we look at specific strategies for how to, in real time, shift from one emotion to the other. And just to give you a basic understanding of this, it's important that people understand how to ladder emotions. Meaning if I'm worried about my future, it can be kind of hard to immediately jump into being grateful for what I have or feeling hopeful about the future. However, I can get from worry to overwhelm. And from overwhelm, maybe I can get into um, uh, maybe I can get into frustration. And from frustration, maybe I can get into boredom. And from boredom, maybe I can get to optimistic. And from optimistic, maybe I can get to hopeful. So we teach about emotions and that we can actually, again, dial these things up and down so that people can then actually catch how they feel in real time and put it into action. Our physical skills also build on top of each other. So the very first resilience skill of how to use your body is understanding the importance of being physically active. So the more physically active we are and have a balance of strength and flexibility, the more physically agile and resilient we are. The quick, the more our immune system is likely to bounce back if we are facing a, an, a virus or something comes into our body, but also the more we're able to complete the stress cycle. So we look at the importance of physical activity, not just exercise, but physical activity, and how to find a balance between strength and flexibility as the foundation or fundamental physical skill is using our body. Then the next body skill we look at is uh, 2.7P on breathing for regulating thoughts and feelings. So in addition to using all these cognitive and emotional skills for working with our, how, um, our, our thoughts and our feelings, I teach people how to use their breathing to help them regulate their nervous system. 
either upregulating or downregulating depending on what we need. And I believe that breath is our superpower that very few people are ever taught how to actually use, that we can actually use the, I use the metaphor of our bodies like a car. And so we can use our brakes better. We can actually use our gas pedal better when we know how to use our breathing. And so we teach people breathing exercises, which help us be more resilient because you can calm your, your mind down by using your body oftentimes a lot faster than you can if you are just going to talk back to your thoughts. Here in level three, we talk about nutrition and feeding resilience. So we know that our capacity to bounce back and be resilient in our immune system usually starts with our gut health. So how healthy your gut is, and we know that the gut is also considered our, our second brain, um, and that our first line of defense usually for most pathogens that come into our body is through our mouth and through our digestive system. And so when we have our nutrition is high, we actually feed resilience. We're more, we're, yeah, we can bounce back from from um, from illnesses faster. And I think one of I'm, I really do attribute one of the reasons that in even in getting coronavirus, I had very mild symptoms for about two days. I was still able to speak and give presentations to corporations um, while having this interesting sensation in my chest. I could actually like feel the virus trying to take over. But my nutrition was high, and I knew how to supplement and how to take care of my body and it didn't grow. I have no sense of smell right now because that's one of the side effects of, of coronavirus that I seem to have gotten. Um, but again, that's kind of been the worst of it is that I can't actually taste my food or smell anything, but the, this too shall pass. It'll come back. Level four, the next level is mind body fitness. And these are movements for mastering your life. So like the other Jedi skills that are in real time, um, shifting how you think or how you feel, this is using your body to shift how you think and how you feel. And so I call it the daily dozen and the nifty nine. The daily dozen is 12 movements that start from your feet and go all the way up to your head and neck that you can use to counter the stresses that modern day life puts on us from sitting, from typing, from being on the computer, from looking down, and therefore makes our body more resilient because we're not getting caught up into these patterns where we're either, if you use it, you lose it, but if you overuse it, you abuse it. So we've got 12 uh, basic exercises that we teach people that help them be more agile and more physically resilient. And then the nifty nine are nine movements that you can actually use your body to shift how you think and how you feel. And so those nine movements either our, our movements that make us more creative, meaning we engage both hemispheres of the brain, or body movements for calming the nervous system or getting the body excited when we need it. So the, that teaches a Jedi level mastery of the body that I believe we need for resilience. And the last one is our social slash spiritual skills. So the very first basic social slash spiritual skill that I believe feeds resilience and enables us to bounce back is about meaning and purpose. So this one is called Meaning and Purpose, You Matter. And this module is called The Science of the Hive, You Belong. So in You Matter, we help people understand that we have a meaning-making brain and our brain is wired to go, why? Why is this happening? Why am I here? And that we are wired to need to make meaning of the situation. So we talk about how do we make sense of our life experience and how do we find our own place in all of this. And so part of resilience and people pushing through when these things get difficult is having a strong sense of why and why am I here? And we know that Frederick Nietzsche said, man with a strong enough why can get through any how. And so we focus on helping people really align with what is my why? What is my why that's going to keep me showing up day in and day out to this crazy world that we're in right now and continuing to try to make an impact in any way that I can and continue to show up for myself, my friends, my family. If we don't have that strong sense of why, we know people are not nearly as resilient as they would be otherwise. The next one, the science of the hive, you belong. Then talking to people about the importance of belonging and connection and, and trust to tell the body, I am safe, I am connected. And man, oh man, have we ever felt the fact that we as humans are social creatures, we are hive creatures. Um, we've probably never felt that more until you're being forced to be socially distanced and to be 
quarantined and to be away from people. And we talk about how belonging is subjective, how you can be surrounded with people and still not feel like you belong. And that belonging is a mindset and actually something we have to cultivate. How do we actually actively seek out the support of others? This module 3.12S is about pronoia and the possibility of a benevolent universe. And this is again the social spiritual connection to perhaps something bigger than yourself. And we look on, we draw on the research on of people's mindsets and what's come to be called the primals, which are primal beliefs about life. And there's research that supports the people who believe in the inherent goodness of life and people who believe that life is safe and that maybe life is conspiring for you, that, that even though these things are really, really difficult right now and the foundations of so much of our world are being remodeled and reframed, that perhaps life is actually trying to help you um, is a pro noia belief um, and a belief in a benevolent universe. And here we teach people how to really work with this idea of trust and believing that things are going to work out in their favor but, and that life is good. And on top of all of it, that they can actually seek out opportunities to make life good, to perform acts of kindness. And the last one is the social Jedi level skill, which is uh, what I call intuitions and miracles, mastering alignment. And this is when we look at on a day-to-day -day basis, how do we make decisions and, and uh, better navigate the um, experiences of our life and talk about the decisions that we're making, how we're interacting with the world around us on a daily day basis and how can we tap our intuition and how do we actually create more of the world and the life that we want to be living by working with our mind. So each of these concepts are um, basic building blocks, they're skills, and if you're interested in learning more about them, I'm going to open the lines and move you guys over right now um, so we can have about 15 minutes of Q&A, but if you go to bouncebackbetter.com or the flourishingcenter.com forward slash be cubed, you can see that um, each of these concepts, each of these basic building blocks is built into a course that you can take. Um, we have a free introductory course into the science of resilience where I go into a little bit more of the why and the proof that resilience can be taught. And then each of these are actually here as self-study courses that you can take a deeper dive. But the biggest thing is that these are all concepts that we can build, we can, um, we can learn them, we can train them, we can test them. And I believe that they are the most fundamental skills uh, that we need in order to be able to support us in getting through these tough times. All right, I'm moving you guys over into panelist view um, so I can answer any questions that you guys have for me about, um, about anything I've covered, about resilience, about these skills, about our training programs, about having COVID, um, anything that's on your mind. Um, just give me two seconds. I'm just promoting you guys over. If you want to turn on your cameras, it would be great to see you all um, because this way we can have this positivity resonance of seeing each other's faces. Um, and I'm just going to move you all over and that I think I just got everybody. Um, so if anybody wants to turn on their cameras or if you have any comments or questions or um, anything, please let me know. <laughs> Linda, you're unmuted. Do you have a question or a comment? No, I'm sorry. I will, um, <laughs> I will unmute. I will mute myself back up again. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, I like to call them ahas, woohoos, or huzz. Um, so maybe it's something I said caused an aha moment for you, in which case I would love to hear your aha or a woohoo, which could be like a celebration. Like, yeah, I do do that. Or a ha, which is a, a question uh, that you might have like, huh. Let's see. Uh, Alona, do you have a comment or question? An aha, woohoo, or ha? Oh, uh, no, sorry. I just accidentally unmuted mine. No, you're fine. But you're I, fine. I, you? I live in Geelong, actually, so I know Geelong Grammar very well when you're talking about doing your work over there. Um, and I've got to say, just your story just absolutely moved me. And I just, you're so incredible to be able to talk about this, but then to be so generous with sharing. Um, everything that you that you've shared today as well so thank you so much really appreciate it oh thank you Alana and you said you live in Geelong Australia yeah yeah and oh, last awesome. year I just finished my master's of 
positive psychology at Melbourne Uni. So Melbourne Uni, beautiful. Yeah. Congratulations, Alona. That's huge. Yeah, I love Geelong. Such fond memories there. Uh, let's go to Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi. I apologize to you all this morning. I thought I was having a heart attack. Uh, the whole day's been dealing uh, with that. But first of all, I want to tell you, this has been so wonderful. This is just what I need. Uh, I've been sending, I sent, I sent things to my colleagues to give to my student, to their students and this, these seminars, uh, uh, every um, faculty member has them. And um, will this be recorded and I can yeah. have them listen? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's great. And so much of this, resonates and and I think and I feel such pride in you I feel such pride in all the younger students and what you're accomplishing and what you're putting together uh conceptually I think that this was masterful thank you uh, I actually know a lot of this now I have to apply it and I have to teach it yeah. to other people but thank you yeah, thank you, Lisa. And I'm so glad to hear that you're feeling okay. That must have been very scary for you this morning to feel like your body was on high alert. So I'm glad you are well. And thank you for thank your you. feedback. Well, I, was, I was told by three different nurses to go immediately to the emergency room. But uh, my husband recently passed away. I am um, live alone. I would rather uh, die of a heart attack than uh, the virus and I have all the preconditions and I'm 81 years old so yeah. this yeah. was uh, so also this reinforced me uh, I think that I I am one you of are the, resilient I am resilient and I went through about a decade where I felt I lost myself and uh, people kept telling me how strong I was. That wasn't helping me. I felt during this period that I was so vulnerable. So just everything about this. I'm sorry, I'll stop talking. But No, you're great. I'm so Thank glad you. I decided to turn tune in and I had to turn on my video to be able to talk with you. So. Yeah. And Lisa, you look phenomenal for 81 years old. My goodness. Rocket lady. It's amazing. You look when wonderful. You put on lipstick. I've got a, oh, thank you. <laughs> so Bye. great. That's I so great. Said, you look phenomenal. You. It's so nice to that's you nice just receive it. Just receive it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Um, there was a question in the chat box around how long does it take to master these skills? Is it a lifetime of work? I think that like all things, we can talk about the process of how do people manage or learn new information. And we go from being unconsciously incompetent to unconsciously competent. And so to answer your question, Marie, um, she left the room, but it, she watches the recording. Like all things, you learn these skills, you don't know what you don't know, and you don't even realize that there's actually a science to resilience. And then over time, you start to actually learn that there's concepts that actually apply to this, and you realize that you are actually lacking this thing called resilience, meaning you're consciously incompetent. You realize, yeah, my emotions do get the best of me, or I have this crazy monkey mind chatter that is always getting the best of me that I don't... Um, that I don't know how to control. And so you're just aware of it. And then what we aim to do in learning these skills is you start to become consciously competent, where you can actually catch yourself in real time. And in terms of learning these skills, they can be taught within within minutes um, in, and they can be reinforced. So we put exercises together where people are able to practice them. You can actually practice catching your thoughts and redirecting them. You can actually practice the physical skills of relaxing your nervous system and actually down regulating your stress response, or you can actually become better at breathing. You can be a better breather. I think more people now than ever before are recognizing, gee, my, my lung capacity is something that I should maybe work on training because it's so important. Um, so you can also, um, you, can, you can train these things. And, um, and I think that the capacity that comes over lifetime of personal mastery in this is about, more, um, if anything, just being able to catch the thoughts and redirect them and, and to actually catch the opportunities to be resilient. Because the skills themselves are, are simple, it's the catching it 
it's the catching ourselves in that knee-jerk reaction place. Um, and so over time, we start to slow down the stimulus response. And then it's not just something happens and we react. We can actually say, okay, how do I want to feel? How do I want to think? What, um, how do I want to show up in this situation? And so that's how the mastery comes. And then things that are triggers over time just don't even trigger us as much anymore. Uh, JW asked, how do we access the recording? That's a great question. I'm pretty sure it's posted on the same website that you guys registered with. Um, I could try to look that up. I'm like, I'm just the messenger. Yeah, the same website where you guys registered, which is the, the MAP alumni uh, website. I can actually probably pull it up as we're, as we're speaking, um, is where you go. I will drop it in here. Um, uh, to, 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 or maybe I won't. Um, it's, it, it'll, it should be, because you guys are registered, it should be emailed to you as well. And you can also access the recordings of the others. Um, and I will send out the PowerPoint to all of you that was, that were registered for this as well, personally. Thank you. Um, anybody else, any comments or questions or anything on anybody's mind from anybody that's here? Cool. I am, um, since we have about five minutes left, one of the things I love to do is to have people go around and just share what's one thing that you might put into practice or one thing that you're taking away. And it's a great way just to hear from everybody and um, your voices all matter to me. And it can also really help other people reinforce new knowledge. So anything that stood out for you as just a concept or an aha that you've had, I'll call on you alphabetically. Let's see if we can hear from you. Candy, is there anything that you're like, I like that. I'm going to tuck that away and take that with me. Candy, are you there? Okay, we'll go to Colin. Colin, are you there? Would you unmute yourself? You can also type it in the chat box, but just one thing that you're taking away. Oh, thanks very much, Amelia. I really enjoyed your reference to Chris Peterson because I met him uh, many years ago and I, I yeah. love the quote that you use, that it's not necessarily about the end result, but you're going to get there if you struggle well. Yeah, yeah, it's how we how we do in the dance, right? Not the end of it. Thank you so okay. much. And Danielle, you're unmuted. Oh. Hello, um, I'm also from Geelong as well, so small will. Um, <laughs> and my dog's saying hello. <laughs> hello, um, doggies. I. I think for me, probably it's all been a really good refresh. Thank you very much. But I think something for me to focus on um, is the physical side, particularly I'm feeling sitting down a lot at the moment. So remembering to yeah. do this, the strengthening and the flexibility and just, yeah. you know, moving my body while I'm kind of stuck in a very small space is really important. Yeah. So. yeah. Physical agility physical resilience enables mental resilience thank you danielle thank and you. alona um yeah this was this was a really clear one for me so um my family's aboriginal and um so i work for the department of education at the moment and um, working with all aboriginal kids from in the barwon region so in our region here and for me um i really like the idea of um bouncing back better so i'm going to use that 30 days, you know, what you talked about, a little calendar of um, getting these Aboriginal kids to write down some things that they can do each day so that then when they do come out of this at the end that they are yeah. better for it. You know, it's it's a sad situation, but yeah. a lot of our kids are quite disadvantaged and um, vulnerable. So it's it'll be a nice way for them to be able to help move themselves forward. Yeah, that's beautiful, Alona. Thank you for sharing that. Snaps for that. Thank you. And I'll drop into the chat box the link to um, my Better Than Before program. So um, just if you want to watch the video I put together sort of describing it, um, I think you might appreciate it. And uh, let's go to uh, Jenny. You might be, you have to unmute yourself if possible. Okay, we'll go to JW. Hi, JW. Nope, he, he or she just muted themselves. All right. I feel oh, like sorry. I'm knocking a... There you are. Hi, JW. <laughs> this is um, so impressive um, that you've taken these skills and kind of layered them um, and made them um, progressive and learnable 
and um, really taken a lot of the mystery out of um, how to sh- how to be your own resource for mm. resilience. Um, because it, 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 the way that you put it, it seems like an incredible um, pattern to learn and then practice. Yeah. Um, and um, so positive. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, DW. And it's really exciting, right? When we think about it as something that can be taught. And yeah. um, one of the programs that we have at the Flourishing Center is a partnership with uh, GoZen, and we run a certification in positive education, and we mm-hmm. started the Center for Positive Ed. And one of my visions is that um, because I do think of things as a layer, um, I believe that these things should be taught progressively. Positive psychology yeah. skills and social emotional skills should be taught in schools progressively, that yeah. there's skills that they can learn when they're in first grade and skills that they get reinforced and built on in second grade, just the same mm-hmm. way math is taught just the same way science is taught and that if you get to sixth grade math there are certain elements of third grade math that you still needed to learn like we can treat the knowledge of our mind and body in the same way so one of my visions in this lifetime is to um is to create something like that because the way i see it is that they're they're all tangible they can Mm -hmm. be tested you can test kids how well can they catch their thoughts and redirect their thoughts and catch themselves in a thought hole and a thinking trap so thank you. Yeah, um, and I think I think also including movement, including the body, is yes. so central because even if you learn, you know, okay, I can I can be grateful or whatever, but it's not embodied, and yeah. you know, you don't have access to redirecting some of the things that are going on in your body. It, it's very difficult to yeah. shift anything. Yeah, so. yep, exactly. Thank yeah. you so much. Mm-hmm. I'll read uh, Lisa Spencer. She says that her microphone's not working, but she enjoyed the presentation and the 16B6 of B cubed. So uh, the 16 basic building blocks of bouncing back better. Uh, we'll go to Linda if we could unmute you. And if you're yes. there. Hi, Linda. Uh, I love the picture you. of you and your dog. It's so beautiful. And the reason why I'm not showing myself is because I'm not very beautiful right now. It's been one of those days. <laughs> Kidding. But what I, I joined the club. <laughs> <laughs> and I have three of those dogs, by the way, and they're part of my positive psych. They're bearded collies and they're happy heads, and I'm so grateful for them. But what I really appreciated so much, your your story and your heart and your commitment you. to show up for us even now. I'm just really blown away by how life has shaped you and how you've bounced back and, and what you've done. So thank you for that so much. Thank you. Really, really touching and, and brings up tears. But I also appreciate the way your mind has put together all these beautiful tools that we have in positive psychology, because it can be, it's a lot to organize it in a way that we can encode it and remember it. And I I teach positive psych also. Um, I had an opportunity to go through Marty's classes way, way back with Karen and Marty and and a whole group. And I teach it now at a community college, and I also teach addiction counseling. And so I would love, I love this breakdown of making it yeah. mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual, and the whole cube thing, so that people can pick which part of the cube they want to use, but also yeah. that they can encode it in a way that makes sense. Because I've always told them there's not a formula, but this yeah. really breaks it down to where they can find their squares. And so yeah. it, it really help me not be so scattered in my conceptualization and yeah. and I love the movement part and the breathing part and mastering our own energy there's just so much that I'm really excited if it's okay to take to some of the students again yeah, not to pop it at all but yeah um, we have a bunch of people who are in recovery and becoming addiction counselors now and I brought this into the program that recovery is more than not using, it's becoming you. And so I think this is a wonderful tool they'll be able to use. So I really personally appreciated it. I appreciate you, you're inspirational and thank you. you. And just the the way that you've encoded it. So thank you for your gift to us as well. And and just all the best to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that beautiful feedback. And we'll go to Lisa as our last comment. I actually just say one more thing, Linda. I forgot to mention this, but mental, emotional, physical, and social um, happened to be Marty's initials, M-E-P-S. And that was by accident, <laughs> which is just so funny. So I once said to Marty, I was like, I didn't, I just kind of indirectly ended up naming the program with, uh, in, your, in your legacy. 
Wow. All right. Is, is that his middle name? Okay. And yeah, he has an E and a P in his middle names, M-E-P-S, which is funny. Uh, we'll go last to Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Um, at this stage in my life, what's most important to me is a social spiritual. And what I realized as you went down the cubes is I'm doing okay with you belong, but you matter. I'm having a lot of trouble with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I can see personal way right away to work yeah. on this. Yeah. And it's that, that gives us the fire to push through, right? When we know that we matter, when we know that we belong. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I know you will find your way, Lisa, as you have with every the other things, because we're wired to bounce back better. Uh, yeah. Sabrina, Sabrina, good to meet you. Just came on. We're going to log off. And so I just want to say thank you guys so much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for showing up. I'll send the recording of this out. And if you guys have any questions, if you need anything, please feel free to reach out. You can find me at Amelia at the Flourishing Center .com or directly in the chat box of, of the website. Have a good night, everybody, or day, thank depending you. on where you Bye. are for our Aussie friends. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bless you. You're Thank welcome. You. You're welcome. Bye, yeah. guys. You're awesome. Bye -bye.